Hello, and welcome to episode 243 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechenik, and I'm not here, as always, with Jason Rabinowitz. Jason can't join this week because he is traveling in Japan. Not that I'm jealous at all, but he did send us this brief update on what he's been up to this week. Jason? Riding the rails. We'll have an abbreviated show this week, thanks to the Thanksgiving holiday, and a very happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners in the U.S., or those not in the U.S. taking the opportunity to celebrate as well. We begin with a few updates on stories from last week. Last week's top story was the horse that escaped its stall aboard an Air Atlanta Icelandic flight from New York to Liege. At the time of our recording, we didn't know the fate of the horse, but we've learned more about the incident, and unfortunately, the horse sustained significant injuries and had to be euthanized. According to reporting by CNN, the horse was initially disturbed by turbulence experienced by the aircraft shortly after takeoff. The horse managed to jump about halfway out of its stall and became stuck with its front legs out of the stall and the rest of the horse still in the stall. During the flight, it's impossible to open horse stalls because of the way they are installed on the aircraft. They're designed to be as compact as possible, to keep the horses as safe as possible, and to not allow them to move freely too much because of the possibility of things like this happening. The stalls are meant so that the horses can stick their head out so that the flight grooms can take care of the horses throughout the flight with with water, food, and keeping them comfortable. In this particular instance, it was the design of the horse stalls, as well as the fact that the horse managed to jump halfway out of the stall that led to the distress that the horse was in and, and what ended up happening with the horse being euthanized. We haven't seen any reporting on the fate of the other horses on board, so we're hoping that all of them are healthy somewhere in Europe, but an unfortunate update on last week's top story. Last week, we also spent a considerable amount of time discussing the FAA's safety review team's report that was submitted to the agency earlier in the week. Shortly after we recorded, the FAA announced immediate actions based on the report's recommendations, and they listed a handful of actions that they're taking right away. The first among them is that the FAA will provide additional support to colleges and universities in the Air Traffic Collegiate Training Initiative. The ATCTI, which all good aviation programs need an acronym, is one in which people in college are trained to become air traffic controllers, which sounds great because then they're ready to become air traffic controllers when they graduate college. But up until now, those graduates were still required to attend the FAA's Air Traffic Controller Academy before they were assigned to an air traffic control facility. So now what will happen is graduates from the collegiate training program will still need to pass the air traffic skills assessment exam and get their medical requirements out of the way and security requirements. So they'll still have to pass basically a a medical examination and, and a security screening. But once they do that, they'll be assigned to an FAA facility straight away so that they can begin the on the job training. So they won't have to go through the whole air traffic controller academy because they will have already done all of that work at their college. So that one seems like a no-brainer and an easy way to speed along the pipeline of air traffic controller going from being hired to being an actual controller. The FAA also announced that they will begin year-round hiring of experienced controllers from the military and private industry. So at this point, or up until now, there were windows throughout the year in which air traffic controllers who are already experienced either doing military air traffic control or have worked as contractors for private corporations doing air traffic control in the US and elsewhere, those people would have to apply during a certain window of time and then perhaps be hired or not. The FAA now says that they'll have an open track all year round for those folks. 
They will also keep filling, the FAA that is, will also keep filling every seat at the FAA Academy and increase classroom capacity beyond its current limits. Sounds like a good idea. And they will also expand the use of advanced training across the country. There are new facilities in Chicago and San Diego that have recently opened, and there are also facilities opening in Nashua and Phoenix this coming spring. The FAA will also finish deploying tower simulator systems in 95 facilities by December 2025. The first system is scheduled to go active in January of 2024, so next January in Austin. And finally, to strengthen our safety culture, the FAA will provide reports from the Air Traffic Safety Oversight Service to the FAA Administrator and Aviation Safety Associate Administrator. So these are the reports that are filed across the FAA's system that are calling out safety incidents. And those reports will now be forwarded on to the FAA administrator. Personally, I'm a bit surprised that they weren't forwarded on to the FAA administrator before, at least in part. And finally, our final update from last week, after Jason and I spent not considerable time, but more than a few minutes talking about how much Emirates President Sir Tim Clark didn't like the A350-1000 in its current iteration and how he was goading Airbus into creating what would be a better aircraft, Emirates turned around and ordered a bunch more A350-900s. The airline ordered an additional 15 A350-900s, bringing its total A350 order book to 65. No A350-1000 orders, but the A350-900 seems plenty good. And then in new business, today Boeing 737-10 received FAA sign-off to begin certification flight testing. That means that Boeing can now begin flights with the FAA pilots on board and begin building the large volume of data necessary for type certification. The 737-10 is the largest variant of the MAX family, and it's capable or will be capable of holding up to 230 passengers. Boeing expects certification to take place by late next year. Boeing also expects certification of its 737-7, which is the smallest variant of the MAX, by the end of this year and expects deliveries to begin to Southwest early next year. And finally, finally for the show this week, It's a quick show because I need to get back to preparing Thanksgiving dinner. By the time you listen to this, I hope my family will have enjoyed Thanksgiving dinner. But next week is a very exciting week for the show, and it's definitely one you're not going to want to miss. We'll be speaking with North Atlantic Airways Captain Olav Lindstrom, who piloted the first 787 flight to Antarctica. So if there has anything you have ever wanted to know about flying to Antarctica, generally speaking, flying a large aircraft, the largest aircraft ever operate to troll airfield in Antarctica, and what it takes to pilot that type of flight, please email us podcast at fr24.com with your questions, and we'll do our best to get those answered. Stay tuned for that next week, as well as Jason's return to the show, but not return to the United States because he is having an extended journey through Asia. So we'll hear more about how he got there, how his flights have been, and what he's been up to, as well as more from Olaf Lindstrom from Norse Atlantic Airways. A quick show this week. Thank you all very much for listening. Have a happy Thanksgiving again to those who are celebrating or perhaps in a bit of a food stupor by now. Thank you all so very much for listening and happy tracking. We'll talk to you next week. Mm